slides. So uh, I assume we're live here. So I'm Jeremy Davis. Um, I'm a principal architect at Red Hat. Uh, I've been around for 13 years or so. And presenting with me today, Rob. Hi, Rob Sidor. I'm a chief architect uh, doing application development. All right, and so we're going to present a microservices transport shootout. Um, we're not going to do perf stuff, right? So if you're looking for like which transport is faster outside of general discussions, um, that's not what this talk is about. We're going to look at um, uh, REST, gRPC, GraphQL, Kafka, how you interact with those, how you build out APIs or how you build out services and how you consume them using Quarkus and talk about some of the design considerations that those force onto your application or bring to your application. Um, so, uh, and maybe hint, gRPC is probably faster, right? I think we can say that sort of, uh, sort of fine right out of the gate, right? So we're not going to talk about fast speed uh, or speed too much anyway. We're going to talk about some other things. Um, so we're going to talk about the basics of each of these technologies, um, talk a little bit about uh, synchronous, asynchronous development. Um, we'll talk about streaming some, and then we'll talk about, we'll look at, you know, client and server, like building, building these from both ends. Like how do you consume these services and how do you build these services? All right, so Rob, you want to take take this for an intro, a little bit about API design, which we've talked about before. Sure, we Jeremy and I've done a, a couple sessions on different API design, mostly around REST and gRPC. Um, you know, REST is a resource based uh, considerations, so everything should be designed around actually consuming the resource. Um, uh, you know, with uh, things like Heyday OS for you know RESTful design. A gRPC is really, you know, what we're going to talk about is it's an RPC mechanism, so it's um, uh, uh, tightly coupled. Uh, GraphQL, which um, Jeremy's used GraphQL, um, is really cool because it's over HTTP, um, but it lets you actually query something so you can only bring back the data you want. We listed WebSockets and webhooks in here because most people uh, are using these. Um, uh, for something, uh, usually a web socket in order to connect to something to bring um, something back like an asynchronous kind of RESTful call or um, async API kind of thing. We we threw SOAP in here because um, Jeremy and I work with a lot of uh, folks out there who are actually still using SOAP because they can't get rid of their legacy. Um, and that's kind of a, you know, really heavy overhead um, on both the uh, development process and on the communications. And then Kafka, um, primarily because we see a lot of event-driven microservices. We've run things with event-driven microservices um, architectures. And we really wanted to compare the REST, the gRPC, the GraphQL, and the Kafka, because those are the things um, that people are uh, primarily using in their microservices architectures today. All right, so first things first, right? So REST. Um, when microservices uh, first popped up, right, uh, the Netflix toolkit, um, they were mostly talked about, at least most of the examples I saw were done in REST, you know, spinning up uh, REST servers, often Tomcat stuff. Um, but REST is significantly older than that, right? Um, some of the characteristics, it's HTTP, it's HTTP based, and it marries HTTP, it matches HTTP very well. Um, it's stateless, right? And it's synchronous, right? So when you know, I make a REST call, um, I have to, I block and wait until I get something back. Um, now, you can get around that with um, reactive programming, and that was one of the reasons like reactive Java, Rx, uh, Java and the Rx um, framework popped up um, for lots of different languages. Rx Java was written by a couple of guys at Netflix, and we're using Quarkus for our examples. Quarkus comes with uh, Mutiny, small rhyme Mutiny built in. It's a much easier uh, learning curve or a much smaller learning curve, I think, than you would find using Rx Java. At least it was for me. Um, but to be fair, I learned Rx Java first, so that might have had something to do with it. Um, but so you can you can do some non-blocking calls, but ultimately the protocol itself, um, you know, is blocking and synchronous, right? Anything I missed there? Rob, anything I missed on that? No, I don't think so. I think, though, um, maybe with uh, REST, you know, because um, there isn't any defined structure on the way you need to do things, there's recommendations, right? So even though we use Swagger, it's not an RPC mechanism uh, that's well defined. So you don't really know how to consume something unless you get somebody's, you know, open API or Swagger. Um, document but um 
And then there's kind of rules to the road on, you know, there's uh, three different ways to do pagination. There's multiple ways to do versioning. And if you don't do, you know, media type versioning, for instance, you can't use RESTful features like hit AOS, right? So um, there's a bunch of rules that are implied. Yeah, they're implicit, um, but you know, you can really do whatever you want uh, with it. So that's part of the uh, kind of a drawback to REST. But I would say everyone can consume REST. So mostly REST is used um, uh, for externally facing APIs, I would say right now. I don't know if you agree with that, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I do think it's a, it's a great thing for externally facing APIs. What I liked about it, this was the original little copy of um, Roy Thomas Fielding, the inventor of REST, um, his d doctoral dissertation, right? Which um, I remember reading this way, way long ago. Um, the thing that I like most about REST is I, I did a, done tons of web stuff and it marries with, you know, get, put, post, patch, and delete. It marries with the web. So um, I'm old enough to remember uh, JSF. And one thing that I didn't like about JSF is it struck me as it was fighting the web for, it was, it was sort of bolting on this other kind of programming paradigm onto request response web stuff. And what I liked about REST is it just said, no, you know, let's, let's just utilize what's there. Let's marry to what's there. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so that's, that's the thing I liked most about it, right? Also, I like the fact that, like you mentioned, there are a lot of already well-established parameters. It's you're, when you hire somebody, they understand how REST works, right? Um, and that's some of the advantages, right? Another big advantage I really like is I like JSON. Um, um, that might sound kind of funny, but it's not, building APIs in JSON, like I can add a feature and I don't break my my clients, right? Because you can safely ignore, you know, if something is added to JSON, unless you make like, you can make breaking changes, obviously. Um, but, you know, you, you don't have to have a correct version to still have clients that work. And I think that's really nice. Um, I also think because it's stateless, it's really easy to scale. Uh, RESTful architectures. So those are, those are two huge pluses in my book. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, uh, let's jump over to the disadvantages there for a second. Now, so, right? Yeah, so even though it scales um, asynchronous, you're going to really need something like an API. So uh, uh, Jeremy is going to talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute when we show you some code. Um, but it's synchronous, right? So all your calls have to be uh, synchronous. So if I need additional data, I need to pass an href or some kind of link in order to get additional data. And so some of the disadvantages here are going to show up as advantages to using some of the other protocols that we're going to talk about. But like Jeremy yeah. said, everyone knows how to do REST. It's uh, for those of us that had to do SOAP a long time ago, it was that was clunky and horrible. And I can't say enough bad things about it. But um, at the same time, you know, uh, she was. We were just talking to somebody the other day who's actually passing XML over REST because they just converted it from SOAP, right? So you can pass whatever you want. You can gzip it. You can, um, you know, but you have to control everything yourself. Oh yeah, SOAP. Great memories in the chat. Yep. So, more like right. horrifying memories. Yeah. Let's look a little bit. Let's look um... Let's look a little bit at that REST endpoints, right? So with Quarkus, REST is, do I, is my server running? I think my server's running. Let's just do a REST endpoint. So what we decided to do here, we would just do a little you know, like sort of sort of coffee shop, right? And so I'm gonna just post, right? I'm gonna use a, a regular REST verb. This is Postman, it's a tool I think most people are familiar with Postman. If you're not familiar with Postman, it's a really great tool. Um, and we can send a post there. Oh, maybe I'm not running. Okay. Close the demo, Jeremy. Um, so yeah, there we go. Already messing up the demo. That's great. <laughs> so RESTful endpoints are pretty easy to understand, right? So we have, um, you know, a path we tell in Cop in Quarkus. We tell it what path we're using. We say we're going to consume and produce um, JSON, um, and then uh, I'm, I'm using injection to, to get something that's going to actually do my work. But so here's the post, and I can do this. I, I can return a, an object, right? And I, I have an object coming in. It handles all the marshalling of the JSON under the covers. It's one of the things that's really nice about JSON. And like I said, I can add extra stuff and it's not going to break my request. Let's see if I have started up now. Yeah, started up now. Let's, uh, let's uh, send the port. Okay. Um, what is he let's see what I've got wrong. All right. Okay. 
and uh, this is a, a smashing start to our demo here um, that we're not even running. Huh? Try it from here <laughs> and see what we'll start it up here. <laughs> um, so anyway, we can do this. We can, all, and then we can, you know, return uh, our record. But this is blocking, right? So I'm going to make a call to this. I'm going to do some kind of work, and then I'm blocking, right? Um, yeah, something has grabbed my server, my gRPC server. That's really great. Um, yes, why does he have like to grab Java? Okay, we have a lot of Java things running. Let's. Uh, Um, so, uh, to... What else do I have here that might be uh, running? I have that running. That's running. It looks like it's already running. Okay. Okay, it's refused. Okay. So, Rob, why don't you talk, talk about something for a minute while I'm... Uh... <laughs> Here. Well, we can, uh, Valentina and I can talk about our mutual um, hate for soap, but, um, yeah, yeah. No so, it, so Jeremy, are you using the, you're using the dev environment though, right? I don't use the dev environment. Okay. What else am I missing here? Still remember those soap <laughs> web services? Yeah. That was that was difficult. <laughs> well, I remember having to put together all the XML and compile everything Justin. with the Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now that I should have no more Java running on my machine other than IntelliJ, right? I'll now I'll be able to boot up. Okay. Run back in my service here. This is always a great way to start a demo, right? Um, well, I'm calling this. I have dependencies here, so uh, let this guy boot up. All right, looks like we're booted up. So now, yes, I'm not found. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's just look at the code here for a second. Um, <laughs> uh, we can also do the other advantages of REST, like we can do a post method. Um, we can use, we have an API for response inside of JAXRS, so I can send a response. Right, I don't have to do objects. Um, a lot of flexibility. You can also do puts. Right, um, this is well established. Uh, you know, sort sort of protocols for using REST. Um, now we mentioned that there's synchronous and asynchronous. So this is all synchronous, um, but you can do asynchronous uh, asynchronous um, development um, with uh, by by kind of asynchronous, where we can mock out something that's sort of asynchronous, right? So instead of blocking and waiting to return the actual object after the processing work is done, we can return an accepted, right? We can return a 202 status and um, then go about our work and then eventually update the application a number of ways. Actually, Rob, talk about a bit about how we can update, uh, how we can become eventually consistent if we model things out this way and why you do that. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing. Sure. Monkey with my demo again for a second. Sure. So I mean, we can do uh, with REST. We can do a long pull. Um, we can do polling exercise. We can use the async API. But more or less, you're going to need some kind of event-driven um, API. So um, uh, you know, with uh, Quarkus, um, you know, we're using uh, Vert X behind the covers. So you have um, some kind of event-driven or reactive approach to do that. Um, but there's really no actual mechanism itself without an API in order to do REST. So, um, did you ever figure it out yet? Yeah, yeah, we got the REST running, so. Okay, um, yeah, let's, so, let's okay. show that real quick and then we'll jump into the other part. All right, we'll just go to gRPC. So let's just go to gRPC. Okay. Well, for everybody knows what REST is in the way. All right, so gRPC, right? This is fun, Corba, com, DCOM, RMI, right? Remote method, remote <laughs> RPC calls, right? So, so I never did just before. 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 We, all right so characteristics it's going to be RPC calls which means we're going to make method calls right we're not going to uh, adhere to like a strict API like rest does 
Um, it's going to use a technology called protocol buffers. They have, they're well-defined. Um, it works over HTTP2. You can stream events, and there's also kinds of interceptors. So you can you know, intercept function, functionality that's happening along the way. It's a really interesting way of doing um, of building out applications. Um, I had not used uh, RMI really. I never used Corba. Um, it seemed really old fashioned, um, but the way it works. Um, however, I do like gRPC having used it. Um, the way it works is you define your applicate your objects in a .proto file. Those get compiled to whatever language you want, and then you pass serialized data over the wire. Um, some of the advantages that you come up with, one, it's very performant, right? It, it's strongly typed. You've got a schema, so it's, it's strongly performant. It works for any kind of language, and you can have a Java client talk to a Node.js client or a C-sharp client. Um, and the code generation happens for you, so you don't have to do that. Your library, your SDK will build all, all that code out for you. Um, the disadvantage, the things that I don't like about it is it's tight coupling, right? So I mentioned like with if you're building REST and JSON, well, you can add something to JSON. It's not going to break the client. Well, if you change your proto file, it will absolutely break your client. So you have to version your proto file. Um, you have to version your objects, which are called messages. Um, and you have to version that, that contract, right? So you have very tight coupling between, between your services. Trade-off is you're going to get a lot better performance. Um, another kind of negative is that it uh, has a bit of a learning curve. Um, as, as you'll see the code, we use reactive code. Well, you know, so we don't have to, but I prefer using the reactive code inside of Quarkus. And reactive code can have a bit of a learning curve, can be a little bit tougher to wrap your head around. Um, and it's not something that I would use for uh, customer facing or uh, facing web applications. I would use it um, for my internal microservices based calls. Is that jive with your take, Rob? Yeah, I think, you know, um, HTTP2 is very fast. Um, you can do HTTP3 with it also right now. Um, just a year ago, probably, or uh, two years ago, um, when HTTP3 started coming out. Um, it's very fast, I think, um, for uh, just to give you an idea of the speed related to it is, um, you know, if you're using Kubernetes or Docker today, using internal communication, you know, under the covers is actually a gRPC. And it's very versioned, right? So it's very easy to version versus the options that you have with REST. Um, so the API, and there's very well-defined rules on what breaks an interface versus what doesn't break an interface, unlike what you see with, you know, um, a schema doing the rest. So there's a those is, those are actual advantages when you're working with a, uh, other groups internally. But again, just like Jeremy said, I mean uh, the normal practice is probably REST for externally facing APIs and gRPC for internal, you know, uh, microservice to microservice communication. All right. So this is what it's going to look like when you're building out. This is your proto file, right? So this is your your contract. This is the schema you're going to have. Um, some of the stuff, you know, syntax, these things, um, your outer class name is going to generate a bunch of classes. This package is not related to your Java package name, so don't, don't relate it to your Java package name. Um, and then you define your service here, and I've got three RPC. Hopefully, everybody can see this um, okay. I've got three RPC methods here, right? So I've got a place order, all orders, and in progress orders. And you notice in progress orders is returning is returning a stream. So I mentioned you you can stream over over gRPC, and that's what we're doing here. You can do bidirectional streaming. I don't have that uh, coded up, but you can do bidirectional streaming with one of these protocols. Um, so I define a place order. I, my Java object, my value object is called place order. So I called this one place order proto, just to make uh, you know imports less of a headache, right? So everything is named proto on the end. Um, that some of this is a little odd, at least a bit of the learning curve. So if I want to do a void method, there's no void. There are no void methods. I need to pass in a message that I just named empty because that makes the most sense to me because I could have called it void. Um, there's also um, you then define like your place order proto. And the, what you do is you def I define a message. So everything's a message instead of a class. And you tell it what you're, you're having is strongly typed, I mentioned, so we have strings, um, and you have to tell it what position of the mess of the message it is. And there's other types in here. There's like, you can see in, in 32 strings, um, you know, so there, there are 
it is strongly typed, whoops, strongly typed. Um, and then you define these other messages. And my menu item proto down here is an enum. Uh, and this is one thing that's a little bit wonky with Java. So the enum is defined by its is positional or its ordinal number only. It's not going to give me back a small coffee or espresso. Um, and so I need to convert that uh, inside my Java code when I get that back. Um, so these enums are going to use, uh, you know, these various enums that I have are going to use uh, their ordinals. Uh, but that's but once you kind of get your head around some of these things, it becomes pretty easy to do. Now, what you need to do, um, there's other toolkits. I mentioned we're using Quarkus, so uh, when I when we do a Quarkus compile, all I have to do is you just add in uh, inside of the Quarkus world. You just add in grpc, which is just a Quarkus extension, and by adding that in, whenever I compile the project, I am going to get a bunch of extra stuff in my target directory. And it says generated sources here, gRPC. So let's zoom in here and take a look at some of this. So, whoops. So you notice it creates a whole bunch of stuff here inside of um, inside of uh, my generated sources folder. You don't want to make monkey with this. You need to pull this inside of your Java code, and you can use it from there, right? So I, you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to really interact with these. Uh, let's see what we have to do here. The way this looks like to, to implement a server. Let's come up here to gRPC resource. So in the Quarkus world, I just annotate this with gRPC service. Um, so like on um, a rest endpoint, I had a slash path. I just have gRPC service. Um, and then I am implementing that uh, generated code of gRPC service. So if you look in here, I'm doing a couple of things that are kind of funny. Um, this is, I mentioned, uh, mutiny. This is asynchronous code. So this is, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, this is, uh, so this is small rhyme mutiny. Um, and I have my um, columns method place order. And then this, this is uh, reactive. So what we're going to do is I'm going to create um, this order. And then when this comes back, I'm going to transform it, which means I'm going to take it and I'm just going to cast it into my my order record, or I'm going to create the uh, order record proto from my existing object. And then I'm going to so we can see what this looks like here. When you come in something like uh, in a client like uh, um, because this is strongly typed, it's grabbing reflection from the server. So I can see the various methods that exist here, right? You can see my place order, all orders, and in progress orders. And I can invoke this order and I get back uh, my cappuccino, right? It's, it's put a status and stuff on it, right? But if you notice, I'm ordering, I'm, I'm calling the or, uh, an ordinal value here, right? So I'm putting a one there. Invoke back comes back and that gets translated to medium coffee. So... Rob, you want a large coffee? I always want a large coffee, yes. I always want a large coffee. Now, when we call the all orders, this is going to get all of the orders, including the ones we just put in, right? So this is going to pull back all of the orders. Um, and then this is kind of nice. This is my in-progress orders. Let's pull this. So now what it's going to do, it's going to watch, and we'll be able to stream back anything that comes here. So let's put, we'll, we'll get you a, something different now just to prove we're doing new things. What? Cancel. All right, invoke. All right, there we go. Now get this going. All right. And we're gonna crash again. Okay. Well, not my day for demos. Um, so uh, in progress orders will stream back through um, <laughs> as they as they come in. Uh, when when the demo works, they will anyway. All right, so let's look at um, a couple of the way that I'm streaming this back through. I, I am doing a bit of a uh, so all orders. If I just run all orders, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull I'm, I, I, this run on virtual thread. I'm using reactive code and then I'm not using a reactive um, JDBC client. So I just add this annotation that makes it no problem. Um, so what I do is I, I call out, I get all this stuff back. Um, you, you notice I mentioned I have to call payment status ordinal. 
right? Because I want to set the value. I don't know what that is, but I just marshal this into the object I want. And then I send over my uh, request and that returns my request for all the existing orders. Now, the way I'm streaming this, this is a little bit tricky and this is a, a Quarkus specific thing. Um, Quarkus is built on top of Vertex and Vertex has the concept of an event bus. It's an in-memory event bus. It's not like stuff that you used to use before. Um, so I've injected the event bus here. And what I do as part of my reactive pipeline here is I publish the order onto that event bus. And so down here, I'm consuming that order and then just streaming it out, right? And so uh, this is an empty request. It's defined inside of my protocol. And then in, uh, in uh, gRPC, it's just going to publish this out and it'll stream back over. So I don't know why it's... I don't know why my request is crapping out if it works right now and then stops working when I turn this on. Let's just try doing something different again. It changes again. See, see if maybe that the connection works better this way or if I'm still going to get a problem here. Nope, still get a problem. All right. All right. So uh, to sum this up, gRPC is really fast, right? <laughs> Rob, we just said. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. 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 Yeah. 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 PC is really fast, but it's got to type up really fast. Uh, that's the main disadvantage is the type up. Right. So the main disadvantage on the type. I think when we get to the event-driven uh, copy, when we get to the event-driven, you know, that's that's not um, you know, quite different. The other thing is this is really a one-to-one -one relationship. Is this is really so um, in Kafka. When we get to that, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about you know kind of a many-to-many relationship. You know, kind of a many-to-many relationship. Okay. Um, all right. So we will go on to GraphQL. GraphQL is probably the, uh, the most interesting of these. Probably the least, maybe people are least likely to have seen, or maybe that's gRPC. Um, but GraphQL is based around the notion of queries, right? It was started by Facebook um, to, um, since most people were accessing Facebook through mobile applications, and uh, REST APIs get extremely chatty, right? That's the concept of overfetch or underfetch. So I can get back way more information than I want from a REST call, or sometimes I don't get back enough because one of the one of the um, conventions in REST is like if I create a new object, I return the URI pointing to that direct object. So I might just turn back an OK created status and give you a URI. So you have to make two different calls. That kind of gets to be a bit of a pain when you're doing mobile development. So Facebook create, came up with GraphQL. It has the notion of queries um, and mutations. Mutations are essentially posts or, or a, a notion of mutating the data, right? So either creating something new or, or changing existing data. The, really, the thing that's really nice and most interesting to me is that there is a single, the notion is there's one endpoint and then you can dynamically query that endpoint. You don't have to write separate queries and you can write very, very little code. It's very nice from a, uh, a client standpoint. Um, you can also stream things through what's called subscriptions. So similar to the, well, I said it wasn't running, but similar to the way that uh, you can stream things through gRPC, you can stream things through GraphQL. Um, it also has a nice built-in UI, so this is a Quarkus UI for it, and this is, um, there, there's a, a film application that's kind of the default GraphQL, a Star Wars API, right? So if you build this out, this gives you an example of uh, how you build out queries. And you're saying, give me film with ID2, and I want back these values, even though there, are, there can be more values in there. So let's take a look at a bit of that. All right, so... This is our orders, and um, we have a schema. We can get it using uh, introspection through the server, right? Um, so this is, um, it can grab the server, and you notice we have in here, we've got a query for all orders, and we've got a mutation to create an order called place order, and a subscription called in progress orders. So what we will do here, let's, uh, let's place an order. And like the API is nice because it's, uh, we can look at this say large coffee. So you like a large coffee there. And that's a mutation we can place in order for a large coffee, right? And the data we get back, when we get it back to our client, looks a lot like JSON or is JSON, right? So we can, we can deal with this really easily. Um, on the server side, it doesn't look the same as generating JSON, though. Um, it looks really different. So let's look at what it place server looks like. Uh, we'll come over here.
So this is what a place order looks like. So we annotated that it's, whoops, we tell uh, Quarkus that it's a mutation. We give it a little bit of a description and that's going to come up in your API. And then we call place order with a place order command. I create that. And then I also, I, I broadcast this and that's how we stream it, right? It goes over a broadcast processor. Um, and then uh, I return the order record. So this is the order record that I got back right here. Now, if I want to see all orders, I can come over here and I can send this query over and I get back all the orders that I've been putting in um, during this demo. Um, now, that's nice, but the real power here, um, one, I can put in some arguments, right? So let's say I'm going to say Rob. Now I only have Rob's orders. That's pretty nice because I didn't have to write any special code to do that, right? If we look, let's take a look at what this query looks like. This is my all orders query. And all I had to do to implement this is I gave it the potential parameters, right? So I said we can, we can query on name, menu item, order status, payment status. And if I take if I take one of these off, or I can add these you know extra things to match what it is I want to allow somebody to query on, and that's all I have to do. I can just call order service order query, right, and just pass in this you know params builder, right. So it's a little fluent API to build out this query. Um, actually, I built that fluent API to build out the query just to make it a little bit easier. But um, nonetheless, you just pass over the parameters for your query. Um, I can do any of these things. So if I say menu item, I could say you know espresso. How many espressos do I have? For? Right, so I've got two espressos. Um, another nice thing I can do, let's say query get everything. Let's say that I don't actually want, I don't want all of these things back. I just want the name and the menu item. I can unselect all of these. Whoops, there you go. And I can, so I can, I can tailor the data that I'm getting back based on my needs. Right, which is which is really nice, and this is this is pretty slick. What this looks like from a client perspective, um, there's different ways we can do this. So uh, Quarkus has both a dynamic client and a type safe client. Type safe client is an is an interface that you implement, right? So I can I can write my own methods in here. I just have to, you know list all orders, um, but I can implement other methods in here, and then the dynamic one we build up dynamically. So I can say give me all orders with name and menu item, and I can add other fields in here, and then I just call dynamic client execute. Um, so this allows your consumers of your API or consumers of your microservice to be able to, to query things in a, in a manner that, that they're more, most comfortable with. We can also stream, let's do our subscription here. So I, I, I think I really like this a lot versus the RESTful hate AOS pattern. Because hey, in that pattern- Talk about the hate AOS pattern for a second too. I say what? Talk about the AOS pattern for a second, just to make sure. Yeah. Uh, basically, that's um, so I want to in rest, if I want to dynamically bring something back, say I have um, the orders that Jeremy just um, had, I would have to create um, an href link and bring that back so that you could then query it again. And that creates a lot of chatty behavior um, with rest if we did it with rest. Um, so if I wanted all the Rob orders versus all the orders, I'd pass back an href that would uh, give me a link to um, get just the portion of the orders I wanted. So for each of the things that Jeremy just selected or deselected, I would have to pass back another link and then do some other kind of query. Uh, Jeremy's actually doing it dynamically with GraphQL and that really reduces the round trips that I'd have to make um, in order to do that same kind of process with um, REST. Yep. So. I think it's pretty pretty nice as well. I, I like this, uh, this this ability to stream uh, these orders. So we're streaming these orders. These are coming through in real time. Um, and so this is how you do queries, how you do mutations, and then how you stream your orders. Oh, I guess we could look at the Quarkus one. So it's also built into Quarkus, which it's built into uh, most of these. Most any any uh, Apollo is the Node.js client that's most common. It's also built in there. Where is our dev services? Extensions, tasters, where is GraphQL? GraphQL, GraphQL, oh, there we go. GraphQL UI, right? So here you go. And you can write some, some queries. Um, so we can, let me just cheat and paste in one of the queries that I have written here. Um, yeah. So I'll just cheat, put that in there and run it. 
unexpected token. So. Clean that up a little bit, right? And okay, I'm going to do this wrong. Um, I should have another all orders. Um, okay. Anyway, the UI exists <laughs> right here if you're more confident than me at writing your queries in real time. Yeah, let's. Uh, right. We don't have that long left. Let's. Uh, yeah, let's jump let's in here. Yeah. yeah. Go so, so the advantage is your yeah your domain gets exposed as a graph that you can pretty easily consume over a single endpoint. So I think it's a great great choice um, for implementing any kind of APIs where people are querying um, querying uh, your your domain. Um, and in terms of performance, although it may not be as fast as say Graph uh, QL uh, as gRPC, um, performance is certainly going to help because you're getting because you're tailoring the amount of data that's coming back over the wire. Right. Um, disadvantages is yeah, a bit of a learning curve. All right. So uh, I think I yeah. just, uh, a couple of comments is, um, you know, it's bringing back JSON. I think you should uh, consider mm -hmm. gzipping that um, in the encoding um, because okay. it's really uh, going to be more performant. Um, and just be careful of uh, creating chatty behavior by, you know, uh, allowing so many um, types of queries. Yep. All right. So we'll get to Kafka and event driven architecture, right? So Kafka is a little bit. No, Kafka is, ah, all right, Kafka is there. Kafka is a little bit different, right? So it's typically known for streaming applications, right? Um, it marries really nicely with event-driven architectures. Um, essentially, it's a, you know, it's an append-only log file, right? And it's known for its performance and scalability. It is super, super fast, and it is easy to scale up um, massively. Now, there's some things you have to take into account to do that, um, but it can certainly um, I don't know. We didn't have overfetch, underfetch. Should not be on the slide. I don't believe. Um, so some of the things uh, that are good, you don't have to use a schema. You can use a schema. I like just using JSON, and that's what I've got in the example. Um, and it's extremely performant, um, which you already mentioned. Um, another big advantage is because it's essentially an append-only log file, meaning everything that gets sent to Kafka is persisted in that you know Kafka um, file, Kafka log you can go back and replay this. And so if I want to change my business logic, I can store that off. I can go back, I can make changes to my business logic, I can deploy that and run my exact messages back through the system in, you know, in, the, same amount of in the same time frame that they were before. And I can see if my uh, changes um, you know, are, are, are exhibit the characteristics that I expect. Right. So if I, I'm changing my business logic so, so I get a different outcome, I can verify that using actual data, using actually the same data. Um, you can also use that for debugging. And this is one of the biggest things, um, you know, the people I work with who use Kafka, this is one of the biggest things that they like about it. Anything to add, Rob, on that? Yeah, I just like the fact that it's um, many to many. Um, I can pass uh, different messages through it, but I, it, it opens me up to more uh, uh, types of event-driven architectures like CQRS, Outbox Pattern, and things of that nature where I, I can actually do some more advanced um, kind of microservices architecture um, with that. Now, that's also part of one of our disadvantages, right? So um, it's asynchronous, and it means that your application will be eventually consistent, right? So when we're using REST, like we're going to send over, uh, we're going to post something over and we're going to get back something pretty quickly. And we talked about how you can do that asynchronously, but you know, it's still mostly synchronous. Um, same thing is going to be true with GraphQL or with gRPC. Um, but with Kafka, we can't do that, right? We're going to pass a message and then something's going to have to happen somewhere else. And then it's going to have to let us know that that, that it finished doing, doing that work. Um, as, as um, Rob mentioned, of course, you can use CQRS. So let's say that my service sends something over to the barista who's actually going to make the drink. The barista might store, might just write to a database, right? Um, there's tools. We have Debezium that can watch that database and then pop a message back onto a Kafka topic um, to notify the application. Um, the application that does the processing can just pop something back on a, on a different Kafka topic. There's different ways you can do that, right? But you have to build you you, you have to build decoupled applications using Kafka. That's both a, a, a pro and a con, right? Overall, I think it's more of a pro, but um, but it, it's not going to be as fast as you know doing request response. Now, the way this looks inside of so this is this is pretty simple thing. This would be a REST endpoint 
um, with the path of Kafka. And what it does is it's got a, an emitter, and this is just going to set. This is what so what this is going to do is if you post a message to place order, it's just going to send it out onto a Kafka topic, right? Which is a, 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 a Kafka queue eff effectively. And then it's going to listen for another one, and it's going to consume that. And when it's ready, it's just going to say it, it, it came back, right? So I also have another service over here that's also running, which is my drink station that's going to actually make my drink. So it's going to be listening. It's got a Kafka resource as well, and it's going to be listening. It's going to consume, and I have this blocking annotation because it's running on an event loop. Um, and what I'm going to do here is make the thread sleep for some random number of seconds to, to you know, make it seem like we're we're waiting for a drink to be made, right? And when it's done, it's going to send it out to a different Kafka topic. So my one microservice gets a message, pops it onto a Kafka topic. The other microservice does some processing and pops another message back onto that topic. Um, and that is also why it kind of marries well with... Uh, with a venture and architecture is um, the reason it marries, marries nicely with a, a venture and architecture is it's events, right? An order has been placed, an order is now ready, and the, it's easy to model those as events. So let's see if we send this out. For, of course. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so let's go straight from the uh, source. Here we go. We will put a Kafka consume, actually, we'll, our, we'll add our consumer there. So producer, nope. So this is KCAT, which is a command line Kafka tool, but it, if, you, if it can't connect to a, uh, running Kafka, it's, just, it, it, it's not very happy. So let's see where in my dev UI uh, Kafka is actually running. Um, say Kafka. Oh, yeah, OK. Kafka isn't running, didn't start. OK, so anyway, um, <laughs> this is what it looks like from a programmatic standpoint. Um, we, we have to be loosely coupled. Um, we have to react to events and then create events that we emit onto Kafka topics. I think it's the worst I've ever had a demo go during a presentation. <laughs> yeah, it just happens. It just happens. Because <laughs> yeah. you know why it happens? Because we practice so many times, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's payback um, for all the practice. All right. Yeah, let's let's go to conclusion. Yeah. We, were actually, we, were, we were taking things out of the demo earlier today, right? <laughs> we had too much stuff to show. Um, okay, so conclusion for our transports, right? So, uh, Rob, you want to take this one? And, and I'll, uh... Sure. You know, uh, REST has a, a tremendous amount of flexibility. Uh, even though it's uh, all synchronous, you can do some asynchronous, but you need an API. Um, you know, uh, I would say, you know, uh, Async API is probably the thing to connect to there, um, but it is a uh, synchronous behavior. It's great because it's over HTTP, um, but the drawback is, you know, if you're not using something for a schema, um, there's no actual rules to the road. So you need to use something like Open API or something like that in order to define a schema. gRPC, on the other hand, is fantastic from a performance perspective, but is really tightly coupled. You can do streaming in it, but again, it's it's tightly coupled. So that coupling, that disadvantage, you know, uh, in architecture, you know, everything is about the least worst option. So if you're you're okay with the coupling and you want the performance, then gRPC would be the thing for you. And I I would recommend that um, for better performance internally, microservice to microservice. Um, for GraphQL. Um, the ability to do mutations and queries makes it incredibly flexible. There is a little bit of a learning curve to it that we found, um, but it's very flexible. Um, and Kafka is kind of tries to be the best of all worlds, but it's really a many-to-many -many relationship. So, you know, many producers, many consumers, it's got that pub-sub model. But um, the drawback is it's uh, complex. I have to be running a Kafka server. Um, I have to set up storage for it. I have to decide what I'm going to be doing. It does open up a new world of different kinds of uh, designs and uh, architectures like CQRS and 
the outbox pattern, etc. But um, you have to decide whether or not you want that complexity for the good things that you're going to get, right? So all in all, it isn't about um, which one's the fastest and which one is, you know, should I choose over all the other ones. It's about choosing the right tool for the right reason. I would say that the majority of people, if you want somebody to consume your externally facing API, it's going to be REST. If you want to do something that's going to be hyper performant um, and very well defined within your organization between your microservices, it's gRPC. Uh, GraphQL, if you're going to have to do a lot of data manipulation and you want different kinds of queries for people in your organization, say you're designing a data mesh or something like that, then probably GraphQL or Kafka are going to be um, the things there. And if you want an event-driven, full-on event-driven microservices architecture and you're going to pay the price for the complexity, then Kafka is uh, the thing for you. I don't know. Is that, a, is that my round out there, Jeremy? I think that's pretty good. Uh, and one thing, too, that we should mention, you can absolutely combine these things inside of the same application, right? So, you know, having REST APIs or GraphQL APIs on your front end and using Kafka to re, to have microservices communicate on the back end is completely reasonable, or gRPC on the back end, I would find completely reasonable. All right, and guys, thank you. This cool. is how you can get in touch with us if you uh, want to, uh, feedback, complaints, comments, um, or like any further information, you can email us at those uh, Red Hat email addresses. Um, any comments or uh, or anything on? Um... I, I think uh, there was a question about putting the sample code out there. We will put the sample code out there. Um, we'll figure out how to share you with the, the group for the. Um, we'll put a look at um, the slides. The slides are going out, right? Yep. Right. Valentina, the slides are going out, I think, right? Well, the, the videos will be out. Um, yeah. Do we have a URL that maybe we we'll, can share? We'll, we'll, tweet it. we'll tweet it and put, post it on LinkedIn. Okay. Well, there's a question. Uh, can we see the Kafka demo? Yeah, we, we, uh, maybe Jeremy, while we're talking, if you want to fill with that for a minute without see, the screen on. And, sure. and then, uh, so what do you... Uh, another question, so what do you recommend for simple list POC apps? I would say most people start with REST, and then you have to decide what you're going to do. I, I don't like using REST between internal and microservices just because it's uh, it's all stateless, but um, gRPC is very well defined and easy to version. Um, and uh, Kuro said POC, so I think we're going to use proof of concept. Yeah, REST. REST is easiest, it's the least amount of code. If you're going to do, use Quarkus or something like Spring, I think that's the least amount of code. You know, to be um, honest, given like, so I gotta, I have to argue a little bit maybe, um, just because uh, like with Quarkus, it'll spin up stuff in the background, right? If you start coding and you have yep. Kafka in there, it'll spin up Kafka in the background seamlessly. You don't even have to touch anything. Also, using Docker Compose or Podman Compose, if you Podman Compose, Podman's oh, a yeah. better project. Um, like uh, the Red Panda um, Kafka server is super easy to spin up, right? So you can create a compose file that has a very minimal Kafka on there that's pretty easy to use. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of think I don't have a problem. Oh, like Kafka? Yeah. 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 Kafka is def definitely the resume enhancing activity, too. So you got to take that into consideration. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, I don't know why, Mike. I don't know what to do. Right Any more questions? Uh, hey, tell you what, give me a deal. Ping me if you want to see this full demo without a bunch of mistakes in it. Shoot me an email. I'll be happy to do this. This is what I do for a living, right? So uh, shoot me an email and we'll set one up for you. All right. Or Rob. I'll put Rob's email in there too. Just oh, thanks. Me. Okay, go ahead. Contact either one of us and you'll, we'll, we'll be happy. Run this again uh, without uh, without whatever it was that was going on. Actually, we we have done this before. We've done this uh, a couple times. We do yeah. the, uh, a talk <laughs> once a month where we've done the exact same demo except that it uh, had less issues. All right, well, guys, thank you very much for joining. All right, thank you. Of course. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy and Robert. It was a fantastic session. Thank you so much for the live demos. We know, you know, there was so many demos going on, so I appreciate it. I also want to share uh, the developer sandbox. Maybe let me share the link 
of the developers that Red Hat or com. And then from there, there is uh, plenty of content around developers, and you can access the developer sandbox as well to try these uh, Kafka, OpenShift containers, so many topics there. Um, with that, any, of course, any other questions? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this is the last session of the event. So with that, thank you for your time today. I hope you have uh, learned something as I did. I uh, had fun. But what we're doing, all these sessions are being recorded. So they will be sharing on through email and publish on YouTube in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned. I will publish my email uh, here. I will share it as well in case you need anything. Um, and yeah, Valentina, it's my pleasure moderating this session and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.